Hi, I'm Professor Afshar at Glendale Community College. This is Physics 101, Lecture 15. In this lecture, we'll discuss non-uniform circular motion. This topic is covered in Chapters 4 and 6 of our textbook by Surway and Jouette. Circular motion in general can be quite complicated. Last time, we discussed a simpler case of circular motion known as uniform circular motion. There, the speed of the object was constant. In this lecture, we want to consider non-uniform circular motion. When an object moves along a circle with a changing speed or a variable speed, it is said to execute non-uniform circular motion. Non-uniform circular motion has some important properties that we must understand. In this picture, I'm depicting the motion of an object executing non-uniform circular motion. The object could be a car driving around a circular track as it speeds up or slows down, or it could be a satellite orbiting a planet, for example, with a changing speed. Each dot represents the position of the object at a fixed time interval. So you can imagine that the object initially is over here at t equals zero, and then after one second, it's over here, after another second, it's over here, after another second, it's over here. As you can see, the distance traveled between the dots is increasing, so the speed of the object must be increasing, so this depicts a situation where we have non-uniform circular motion. The position vector is radial and has magnitude r. The position vector is quite simple. It's the same as uh, uniform circular motion. It points from the center of the circle to where the location where the object is located, and as you can see in every case, by virtue of having a circle, the magnitude of the position vector, which is denoted by lowercase r, is simply the radius of the circle. The position vector is tangential and has magnitude v. Um, this is in general true that um, for a given path, the velocity vector is always tangent to that path. Here we have a circular path and the velocity vector is everywhere tangent to it. If this were uniform circular motion, these velocity vectors would have exactly the same magnitude, so the length of the arrows would not be changing. But since we're now talking about non-uniform circular motion, the lengths of the arrows can change. They can become longer if the object is speeding up, or they can become shorter if the object is slowing down. In either case, the velocity vectors are described as tangential, meaning they point in the tangent direction, and the position vectors, the blue vectors, are described as radial, meaning that they point along the radius. The acceleration vector is somewhat complicated. The acceleration vector points inwards, however, it does not point directly to the center of the circle. So the green arrows here denote the acceleration of the object at each moment in time. Recall that in the case of uniform circular motion, these acceleration vectors pointed directly to the center. Now they point inwards, but they point off-center. They might point a little bit above the position vector or a little bit below the position vector, depending on whether the object is speeding up or slowing down. In both cases, we say that the acceleration vector is both radial and tangential, meaning that the green arrow has a component along the radius, but also a component along the tangent. So it has a radial component or coordinate and a tangential uh, coordinate. It's useful to understand why the acceleration vector points inward in the case of circular motion. To calculate the acceleration vector, we need the velocity vector at two moments in time. Recall that the average acceleration vector is defined as the change in velocity with respect to change in time. So if we want to calculate the acceleration vector, we need to know the velocity vector at two moments in time. We can call those initial and final, and we need to calculate their difference. In this picture, I've depicted the position of the object at two moments in time and I'm indicating the velocity, initial, and the final velocity. The velocities are tangent uh, to the circle, and their magnitudes are not necessarily equal to each other since this object could be speeding up or slowing down. To subtract the vectors, I'm going to move one of the vectors over to the other one so that the tails coincide, 
and then I'm going to connect the open ends. This vector here depicts delta v if the time interval between this point and this point is only one second, then we can say that the average acceleration vector is equal to delta v divided by one, which means that this vector is basically the acceleration vector. If we want to know its exact magnitude, obviously we need to know the exact time interval, but the point of this demonstration is just to show that the acceleration vector is going to be pointing into the circle, but not exactly towards the center of the circle. Let's do a practice problem involving non-uniform circular motion. An object is in circular motion. When it is at 30 degrees, its acceleration vector is minus 4, comma 0. Find the radial and tangential components of this acceleration. So here we're imagining an object that is executing circular motion. At one moment in time, the object is located here. Its angular position is 30 degrees relative to the positive x-axis. At this moment in time, its acceleration vector in Cartesian coordinates is minus 4, comma 0. In other words, if we were to draw this acceleration vector, it would look something like this. So the acceleration vector has an x component of minus 4 and a y component of 0. Alternatively, to get from the tail to the tip of this green arrow, we would take four steps in the negative x direction and zero steps in the positive in the y direction. The acceleration vector here is expressed in the Cartesian representation, but as I have tried to emphasize uh, over the last couple of lectures when discussing circular motion, it is important to use radial and tangential coordinate systems. So what we want to do is calculate the components of this vector along the radius of the circle and also along the tangent to the circle. The procedure that will follow is something that we've done before. We're imagining that we have a rotated coordinate system. Here I've rotated my coordinate system that the, so that the x-axis points along the radius and the y-axis points along the tangent to the circle. You can refer to these axes as the r and t axes, as in the radial and tangential axes. And then, as usual, we're going to construct a right triangle. We'll start at the tip of the vector. We'll draw a, a line that forms a 90-degree angle with our rotated x-axis. Then we'll have to do some geometry, of course, to figure out some of the angles. Um, there are several ways that we can do this. The x-axis here and the acceleration vector here define two lines that are parallel to one another. The radius defines a transversal that intersects those, and this angle here and this angle here must be equal to each other. These are alternate interior angles of a transversal. So if this is 30 degrees, this is 30 degrees. Now that I have my right triangle and I know the angle inside that triangle, I can easily figure out the radial and tangential components of the acceleration vector. This bit here is what we can call a rad, as in the radial component of the acceleration vector along the radius. And this bit, or this leg of the triangle, is what we can call the tangential component of the acceleration vector. We can now use trigonometry, sines and cosines, to find the opposite and adjacent legs of this triangle. Cosine of 30 degrees is going to be the uh, adjacent leg divided by the hypotenuse. The hypotenuse is simply the acceleration vector and its length is equal to 4. You can see that because its components in Cartesian coordinates are minus 4 and 0. To find the magnitude or length of a vector, you simply square its x component, square its y component, add them and take the square root, which gives you 4. So we can say that a rad is simply 4 times cosine of 30, which gives us 3.46. However, we do need to include a minus sign in front because the acceleration vector points into the circle. And by convention, when a vector points into the circle towards the center, we consider that the negative radial direction. When it points out of the circle, we consider that the positive radial direction. 
the tangential component is going to be 4 sine of 30, and that's just going to be 2 meters per second squared. In our last lecture, we discussed the case of uniform circular motion where the speed of the object was constant. In this case, we generalized our discussion to non-uniform circular motion where the speed might change. It's instructive to compare these two uh, types of motion next to each other. Notice that in both cases, the position vector has no tangential component and its radial component is simply the radius of the circle. In other words, the position vector points strictly along the radius and does not point along the tangent to the circle. In both cases, um, the velocity vector is strictly tangential. In other words, the velocity vector has no radial component. It does not point along the radius. It points strictly along the tangent to the circle. However, for uniform circular motion, V is constant. Whereas for non-uniform circular motion, V depends on time. It could be increasing, it could be decreasing, it could be doing both as the object um, goes around the circle. If you imagine, for example, a race car driving around the circular track, at some points the race car might speed up and at some points it might slow down. In general, for non-uniform circular motion, we can only say that V is a function of T. The acceleration vector in general is the most complicated one. Um, it has a radial component. If we are talking about uniform circular motion, that radial component is minus v squared over r. We proved this fact meticulously last time. It turns out for non-uniform circular motion, the radial component is again minus v squared over r. The tangential component is zero if we're talking about uniform circular motion but in general it's non-zero if we're talking about non-uniform circular motion. More generally, you can say that the tangential component of the acceleration is dv dt. Since v is constant for uniform circular motion, dv dt simply becomes zero. But for non-uniform circular motion, if v is a complicated function of t, then its derivative is not necessarily zero. And that's the end of this lecture. Thank you for your attention.